I think we're going to have a blessed time looking into the book of Habakkuk. Not too many people uh, spend time in the reading of the Old Testament prophets. We find them very, very helpful indeed. And so we encourage you to read the word of God and read it the way it's been given to us by books so that you read chapter after chapter and become acquainted with the central theme or the central purpose of a book and it becomes a part of you. It becomes a part of your thinking. There are, are blessings, there are rewards, there are advantages in it and we just want to encourage people to be readers of the word. Many times I have been uh, faced with questions or I've had folks uh, um, phrase a, a, a question, pose it to me and I try, I've tried to answer, of course. And yet I have felt within that, oh, if, if, if you had only been a reader of the word, a reader of the word, you'd have your answer, or if you didn't, you'd understand my answer so much better. Read the word. We should be so grateful for the Bible, and we should not leave it to, as in the sacerdotal system of clericalism, uh, leave it to some special few uh, like the clergy or the ministers. They're supposed to read the Bible or the theologians. They're supposed to read the Bible and then they're supposed to tell us what's in it and so forth. Let's be grateful for the word of God and, it, and it's in so many languages today and certainly it's in our own. Let's read it for ourselves. And as you read and read, not trying to read something into it, not trying to prove or defend something that you want to have it say but just let God speak to you he, he put it there he recorded it uh, for our learning and it specifically said that one of the things we want to remember is as we mentioned in Sunday school today who said it to whom was it said and what were the circumstances and then we begin to get the interpretation and following the interpretation we certainly can make application as the Holy Spirit brings things to our minds that our, our lives might uh, be lined up with the things uh, with the things of the Lord. The uh, this book of Habakkuk is quite different from that of the other prophets. There seems to be just a very small part of it, beginning in verse five, that seems to be a prophecy the rest of it reads more like a uh, a diary or a biography or a memoir where he's recording his own feelings his own experiences and oh what a lesson that is to us as the men were singing a little while ago to keep on praying and pray through to keep on trusting, to keep on believing when, as uh, the Chicken Little said, the sky has fallen. When it seems that everything is going wrong, how important it is to keep the faith. And this is the lesson that primarily comes through in reading the prophecy of Habakkuk. Oh, he was living in a very, very terrible time. In our study of Jeremiah, we got a little glimpse of that time. And Habakkuk was called to his prophetic ministry just at that time when Judah was going down, going under. In a very short time, her beautiful city of Jerusalem would be left in ruins. The beautiful, glorious uh, temple that had stood for so long would be destroyed and become a heap of ashes so many of her citizens would be butchered on the spot others would be taken captive into the far away land of Babylon uh, the capital of the Chaldean Empire and he saw what was happening the rottenness within and the failure of authority the failure of law the failure of law enforcement to handle things. 
And then he saw what was coming. Coming. The awful, awful judgment, overwhelming power from another source, like a a, a steamroller just moving on, crushing nation after nation after nation, and now soon coming upon Judah. It was very, very difficult for him to handle all of this, to see all of this coming. And at the present time, to wonder why, why, why doesn't God seem to be doing something now? It's so quiet. It's so still. There is no voice from heaven. God seems to have stepped back and has allowed these things to go on. The rottenness in the nation and the danger from without. The leadership asleep. And men who should have been patriots were worshipping the idols of gold and silver and monetary values agony of soul and I think to appreciate the the struggle that went on in that man to appreciate that will bring rich dividends into your own life spiritually and uh, m- mentally and as a morale builder because that man really felt it deeply I think to appreciate the book we also take a look at Psalm 77. It's worth it. We ought not go so fast or be so uh, pressured, pressured by a congregation or by some people who want to hear an oration or a sermon uh, so that we don't remain adequately deliberate. And I would like to suggest turning to Psalm 77 were some of the very same feelings that Habakkuk experienced or expressed and this was many years before in the days of King David a psalm of Asaph Psalm 77 I cried unto God with my voice even unto God with my voice and he gave ear unto me in the day of my trouble I sought the Lord my sore ran in the night and ceased not my soul refused to be comforted I remembered God and was troubled you know one would think that when he writes this I remembered God and oh all of a sudden I just felt fine But I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. Thou holdest mine eyes waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient time. I call to remembrance my song in the night. There was a time when I sang in the night. Now I lie awake. I can't sleep. I commune with mine own heart and my spirit made diligent search will the Lord cast off forever will he be favorable no more is his mercy clean gone forever doth his promise fail forevermore hath God forgotten to be gracious hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies Selah. And I said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. Reaching back into the past of what God has done. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people, and so on. You'll find it even in Psalm 76, some of the same complaint. You know, 
a poor man was asked why it was that more rich people, more educated people, commit suicide than the poor uneducated people. Oh, he says, that's a simple thing, he says. When an educated, informed person gets into trouble, he sits down and he begins to worry and he worries and he worries and then he takes his own life. But the poor man who doesn't have very much of an education, he gets into trouble, he sits down, and he falls asleep. <laughs> but there is a difference, not only in the making of many books is there no end, but reading is tiresome, and knowledge is a burden. The Bible tells us so. And the more a person really understands the greater will be his responsibility to what he understands, but also will be the, the, the greater depth of his feelings. Consider this combination. Here's a man who believes in God, Habakkuk. And as I said a moment ago, now he's writing this, not like the other prophets, the, like preaching, uh, sounding forth that comes through in verse 5 in the passages that follow and after that it's more like his memoirs as he's recording this is what I went through these were my feelings and then he comes to his conclusion the more a man knows the more he feels the more he's concerned some years ago a doctor said to me he said you know doctors make the worst patients they're the worst patients we were sitting on the porch of a home on Eastern Avenue in the city of Woburn visiting a little while of a Sunday afternoon and he opened up to me some of his feelings which he would not share with others you know as a professional man but he said, you know, doctors make the worst patients. And the reason is obvious. He knows too much. He knows about many, many things that other people never think of. And so the more a person knows, the more he's going to be concerned. I remembered God and was troubled, he says, in the Psalm 77. And here this man I remember who you are, God. And I am upset. I cannot find the answer that's going to make my soul content. For instance, as you read the book, you'll discover this, that here is a man, on the one hand, he's a patriot. He loves his country. And... He sees where it's going. Now other people don't see it. But he can see it. That were it not the danger from without, there was enough rottenness on the inside to cause its collapse. He sees it. And he's a patriot. He loves his country. But he's also a believer in God. He believes in the promises of God. That God chose the people of Israel. And though he allowed ten of the tribes to be taken away, leaving little Judah, surely, he says, we shall die not. God can't allow these Jewish people to become extinct or for the nation to cease to exist. It's unthinkable because God has promised that just as surely as there are seasons, so this people will not cease from the face of the earth but I can't understand it I know that they deserve to be punished they ought to be punished I'm in favor of their being punished God is just in punishing the nation and I know that when a nation is being punished 
there will be a lot of good people that will suffer as well as the bad people. But I can't, I can't hold it. It's more than I can hold. It's more than I can take. Then another thing. God is showing me what's coming. A great and powerful Chaldean nation rolling over smaller nations one after another. Some, some of those nations weren't so small either. Without hardly any opposition. And rolling over Judah. Heathen. Dirty. Syphilis laden. Wicked. Rotten. People. Rolling over God's heritage. How can it be that you would allow such bad ones to come down upon us? You see, this man is thinking, this man is agonizing. But something else. And this, don't miss this. Are you still with me? Now don't miss this. He has a concern. And there is no prophet, personal testimony in the Old Testament, so-called major prophets or minor prophets, that comes through so strongly in this concern as Habakkuk. And what is that concern? It's one that was expressed by a very early prophet. The charming royal singer of Israel, David, who had a concern. And what makes it so difficult for Habakkuk is all these things, nothing seems to just dovetail. He knows God is great. He knows God is sovereign. He knows God is able. He knows people deserve to be punished. He knows all of that. But with it are all of these other things. Why doesn't God? Why doesn't God? Or why does God? What is his concern? Now most people miss it. So at no extra charge. I don't want you to miss it. His concern is God's reputation. And oh, what a challenge that has brought to my own heart this summer, reading through the book of Habakkuk many, many times. And it just seemed to rise up upon my consciousness upon my spiritual awareness why this man this man is concerned for the glory of God and especially God's integrity God's reputation how is God going to come out of all of this absolutely just absolutely honest absolutely holy if he's promised to save his people and he lets them go down the tube, how about his honor? If he's promised to sustain them and fails to uphold them, how about his honor? If he allows a very wicked nation to triumph over a nation that doesn't seem quite so wicked, how about God's honor? Is he playing fair? And if he allows that wicked nation, the Chaldeans, to come and get the honor and the glory and the silver and the power and extend their empire over other nations, treading people underfoot, treating human beings as valueless, like fishes caught in the net that we just read. Does the fisherman have a pitiful feeling toward the fish? And 
what does the big nation think about the individual a human being they're murdering thousands already and they'll be murdering more and how about God how is he going to deal with this how is he going to handle it and when the judgments are passed what about God's reputation you see you look for it you listen as you read as the Holy Spirit speaks to your own heart and you'll find yourself elevated and challenged as never before that the big thing in your life and mine is not the toothache or the toe ache or the wrongs in society or the ills in Christendom but the reputation of a holy God. And Habakkuk's inability to see how God is going to get out of all of this. What he allows, what he sends. What he permits, what he raises up. Leaves him in agony of soul. You'll notice for example in verse 3 as he comments in, verse, in chapter 1 about Judah he speaks of those he says there are that raise up strife and contentions that's within the nation they raise up strife and contentions then notice in verse 6 that shortly God will raise up the Chaldeans from a literary point of view you see the distinction. Evil raised up by man, now the judgment raised up by God. See, the Chaldeans will be the instruments of destruction. Now, here's a very important point And all, if, if, if the new evangelicals could only have their minds cleared up on this. The Chaldeans would be raised up by God. They would be God's instrument as a threshing machine and a thrashing machine upon the nation of Judah that deserved punishment. They were God's instrument. Now listen, the fact that they were God's instrument does not in any way mean that they had God's favor. And if you could learn that lesson and remember it, it would be worthwhile. God picks up an instrument and he uses it for his purpose allows it to go forth according to its own nature and it serves his purpose his glory that does not mean that God is favorable to the instrument that he loves the instrument or that he's kindly disposed toward that instrument what a lesson and it's right there in the book of Habakkuk Do you know that there are that from the book of Habakkuk comes the only expression that is quoted in the New Testament more than twice? In Romans, in Galatians, and in Hebrews. And it's all tied in with a tremendous the tremendous theme of who God is and his honor his glory his fame and that in the balance weighs much much more than human life a nation's existence 
or even the salvation of souls. Oh, to have these values. And when you find Habakkuk in his memoirs, as I, I put it that way, now remember, that's what I said. And you find him coming to that place where he bursts forth in praise and glory and happiness and joy. He didn't get there the way some of us get there when we sing praise the Lord. He got there through agony of soul, heart searching, prayer, and listening. for God's response and when that was all put together and he saw God's integrity was affirmed God's glory manifest and God's purpose served he could rejoice And in his memoirs he seems to write to himself to insist to himself that God is sovereign but, uh, but God is also holy and, 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 and just then when and whatever he reveals to me or tells me I'll have to be content with it but it's not easy to be content. And that whatever must happen on the earth, if it's got to happen, it'll happen. But somehow, the Lord will prove himself true to his word. I don't know how he's going to do it. But when I have his word, I have his word, no matter what the circumstances, then... I can rejoice. When you read it, think of it along those lines. He's concerned about what? God's integrity. God's reputation. He's not questioning. He's not questioning. That God has a wrong kind of, a, or, that, that, or implying that God might have a wrong motive. But it's how, Lord, how can, how can this marvelous concept that you're so holy be reconciled with what's going on now that you're not stopping, and what's coming and you're not stopping? He was writing on the very eve of the captivity of Judah and the awful destruction of Jerusalem. The underlying theme, of course, is God's justice and that God is consistent with himself. So whatever your belief in, belief in dispensations, God doesn't change. And the prophet's concern that God's holiness be vindicated, it was of greater importance to him than the punishment that was to come upon his own people greatly deserved. And we want you to be reading and looking ahead, and may I draw a few things to your attention before we are dismissed, if you will please. Just as looking ahead. Chapter 1, verse 12. We want to see the prophet's concept of God's holiness and greatness. You know what a man knows about God and what a man believes about God and, and the reality of who God is in a man will have all the difference in the world with what he'll act, how he'll act, what he'll do, what he'll think, what he'll say. I say that a great need in our society in America today and I mean beginning in the Christian communions is to teach who God is 
There's so much deviltry and evil going on. Even gossip and misrepresentation amongst the people of God thinking that is there is no harm in lying or exaggerating or twisting a point it couldn't go on if they had a concept of a holy God and who will judge but notice his concept of God's greatness and God's holiness as he expresses it in verses 12 and the first part of 13 Art thou not from everlasting? Isn't that something? You ought to underline it. From everlasting. How great he is. Oh Lord, my God. You know, it's un, it's un, it's, isn't it most unfortunate that you're my God? Others are bowing down to statues. Others are carrying around religious ornaments worshipping stones and sticks and crying to the stars and to the moon but you're my God my holy one higher than everybody else separated distinct and he's in awe before this great God we shall not die we'll be commenting on that later oh Lord Thou hast ordained them for judgment. He admits that. And adds, O mighty God. Thou hast established them for correction. Get it? From everlasting. My holy one. O mighty God. The man's, a man's concept of who God is will have a definite effect and influence and determining influence upon what that man thinks and upon what that man does. And I can assure you that many people would not try to get away with some of the chicanery that's part of the fallen human nature if they really knew who God is. And oh, what an encouragement it is to Christian people, to save people, to know that no matter what happens, you can say, my Holy One. Do you ever stop to think how precious it is to be able to say, my Father, my Savior, my God? Oh, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have no excuse whatsoever. But I do want to tell you that God is still a God of grace and mercy. And one of the reasons he did not uh, 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 slay the leadership in Judah uh, in, 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 in generations before this was he was waiting waiting, waiting for this people to repent. As he comes before them, he says, with stretched out arms. I tell you, God can save you today. Jesus can save you today. But don't think of him as less than the great and mighty one. For this great and mighty one went to the cross of Calvary, was nailed there for you, died for you, shed his blood for you, purchased you, made you accountable to God on one issue. What will you do with Jesus? Don't go out of here, an unsaved person. You don't have to go out unsaved because whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. And he says in verse 13 in first part A, thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. Lord, I know that. You don't tolerate evil. You don't put up with it. You don't close your eyes to evil. You, your eyes are too pure. You can't, you can't stand it. And yet, Lord, look at the mess that we're in, and you've revealed to me that it's going to get worse. His concept of God. Number two. In the last part of verse 13, the prophet's dilemma. Chapter 1, verse 13 and B. 
last part of the wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously looks like a contradiction there doesn't it you can't look at it Lord and yet you're looking at it how canst thou how, wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he the prophet's dilemma is this the Jews deserve to be punished but as he sees it the Chaldeans are worse they don't even believe in God they got all kinds of gods with all of Judah's sins and disgrace and idolatry and bringing in other gods they still had the temple in Jerusalem they still claimed to and they officially they worshipped the true and the living God that made heaven and earth and so his dilemma is this how can God manage to be just and at the same time exercise mercy and judgment and how does it work when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he and from the human point of view which was the dirtiest nation Chaldea or Judah and he says well, well the, the, the Chaldeans are much dirty they're much worse and Lord how can you allow them that are so bad to overcome these that are bad enough well, of course, some people don't think. Some people think they think. <clears throat> and some people do think. And for those who think and are willing to come to grips with what one theologian called great philosophical problems that can never be solved, you and I have to face the fact that in everyday life, there is a struggle going on. Is my God able? And is my God sovereign? And is my God holy? And in his silence, or when he doesn't seem to be doing anything, is he defending his integrity? And our concern should be that of Habakkuk. Lord, my holy one I don't understand this but I'm concerned for your reputation not that you're unable to salvage your name but I, Lord I can't see how you're going to do it it's too much for me one more the prophet is so anxious that God's honor be vindicated he prepares himself for the Lord's answer which he anticipated to be a reproof and you look at chapter 2 verse 1 he expected it to be a reproof that the Lord would make him feel pretty small and he'd have difficulty finding an answer chapter 2 verse 1 I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and I will watch to see what he will say unto me then I know I'm going to be embarrassed and what shall I answer when I am reproved I know he's going to answer me I know he's going to talk to me he, he, he's, he's going to let me in on how he's going to salvage the rep, his reputation and then I guess I'll be tongue tied when, 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 when I'm going to respond after all I've been saying and thinking He's not questioning God's holiness nor God's mighty power, but uh, his heart seeks an answer that will be reassuring. Then, beginning in chapter 2, verse 2, the Lord answers, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. The Lord does answer him. And now the next point in chapter 3. After Habakkuk had received God's message, 
that continues to the end of the chapter 2. The prophet composes a prayer. He writes out a prayer too in his memoirs as an ode to God's integrity and his conclusion. Notice verses 18, part of 19. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he'll make my feet like hind's feet, and he'll make me to walk upon mine high places. Note that one will not come to an understanding of really praising the Lord until he's had some agony of soul, some heart searching, and then has come to rest on what the word of God says. I commend to you the reading of the prophecy or the book of Habakkuk. You're going to get a blessing. I know you will. Let's pray. Father, in the midst of a world of turmoil and confusion, we need to be steadied by the very words that we've been considering today. Anchor us in thy truth, O God, and cause us to be strong therein. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.